Hello and welcome everyone to another Blab. I'm Laura Rubenstein and this is Roberta Shaler. How are you, Roberta? I am in a really interesting place in life, in business, and everywhere. How are you, Laura? <laughs> I am good. I'm excited about our topic today about kind of distinguishing the difficult people and what we're, why we have to deal with them <laughs> and how to deal with them. <laughs> because we get up in the morning. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? You know, I have to admit, I'm sure many of us who uh, can at one point in our life or other have been considered a difficult person. Um, so I think none of us are immune to feeling like we've been difficult at some time if we're willing to admit it. Uh, so I think this is an important conversation because communication is the key to um, functioning in life. And if you have to communicate with difficult people, why not do it effectively? And I know one thing, Roberto, you're an expert at uh, strategically communicating with difficult people. So um, what do you have to say about that? Um, well, there's a big distinction. And you hit one of the major things, Laura, is we're all somebody's idea of a difficult person sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sure, we have what, what the distinction is, is that a difficult person is a person who's maybe going through a stressful time, maybe they're a little uh, under the weather, maybe they're just angry. And it happens occasionally, and probably with more people they're close to than with people they're not close to. And nobody thinks of them as a difficult person. They just think of them as, well, that was a bit odd, or that was a blow up, or Woo, I think I'll stay away from him or her for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but a chronically difficult person is a person who is difficult with everybody most of the time. And there, there's a series of traits that people have, a collection of traits, a pool of traits that chronically difficult people have that just the rest of us who are having a difficult day or a difficult moment or a difficult week don't have. Yeah. And so there's quite a distinction between them. And they're probably, uh, everybody would agree that they are difficult most of the time. <laughs> when there's a consensus around that that third party, then you know you are chronically difficult. That's very interesting. Yeah, um, and just a little bit of introduction about yourself. I uh, we have a question from Amin here about your 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 doctor coat. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I typed to him, but I'll answer it. Uh, if you could see a little deeper here, you would see that it says the relationship help doctor. Yay. And because I do a lot of speaking and whenever I am online doing something like this, I use my brand and my brand is this white coat. So that's why I mean. I think it's credibility building in a sense. You're the relationship help doctor. So you bring in that doctor effect and, um, and and it's it's kind of cute it it it's cute and it's authority building as well so thanks for the props and we're we love the props and thank you for being here and if you have more questions we welcome them in fact there's this really cool little feature on blab now if you put a slash followed by the letter q and then you type your question in it shows up in the left hand column and um the uh so we can see your questions come through clearly and yeah absolutely um, um we're all about authenticity and i'm all about marketing and branding and so uh we're definitely going to share with you the inside things you can ask us anything and we'll pretty much yeah, absolutely. tell you our honest answer or honestly not answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not a difficult person so i'll answer that straight on <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, okay, we have two types of difficult people. We have people who can be difficult on occasion and people who seem to have a pattern of being difficult. Yeah, so, let, me say, let me say something before, before we go on, that people who have the pattern are very good at not showing the pattern if they are trying to impress you. So if you're dating, if they've just started at a new job, it won't show up. They mm. know how to suppress the pattern, but not be, well, I shouldn't say that. It's not that they're suppressing the pattern. It's that people with who are chronically difficult are 100% concerned with winning in every moment. 
and they know what to do to win in the moment. Mm. Right. Cool. All right. So they need to know how to win in the moment. So what you, you said something very key, which is they're very good at showing up without, without the pattern yeah. when they want to win. Right. Yes. So do you have any tips for how we could identify that they might be, are there any little red flags we should look for that they might be a chronically difficult person? No, there are huge red flags. Okay. <laughs> red flags. But here's the problem, Laura, if you're dating one, then you're in a hormone haze. And when you're in a hormone haze, those things show up, but they, they just show up occasionally enough so that you make excuses for them. You mm. understand, you you make allowances, you think, oh, and they apologize profusely because they don't want to blow the cover, right? Now, I also don't want to give the impression they're doing this on purpose, they're not. They're doing this from a, a psychologically difficult place and they are not doing it on purpose. What they're doing it is because they need to win in the moment. And mm -hmm. keep that in mind all the time that we're talking about chronically difficult people, everybody, because you know people who have to win. You know people will tell you uh, what you want to hear in one moment with no intention of ever doing anything about it. You know people who will say black is white on one day and 10 minutes later they'll say uh, white is white and and they won't take any responsibility for what they said 10 minutes ago. These are chronically difficult people. Yes, and so that sounds like another pattern when they say one thing and they turn around or another sign, they turn around it and is. say something else. It is, and you, you ask for red flags. Well, one of them is, I'm gonna give you four. Okay, because if you see these at all, if you're if you can get yourself out of the hormone haze or the joy of a new job or whatever it is that is affecting your uh, makeup, that is not allowing you to see clearly uh, what's going on because you really don't want to, <laughs> because then it wouldn't be as nice and lovely and wonderful as you think it is. Mm -hmm. So you suppress that. But one of the keys is that. Um, Chronically difficult people engage in what I call all or nothing thinking. Mm. One minute you are the most wonderful creature in the world. And the next minute you're the scum of the earth. Like you are the best parent that ever happened. Thank you so much for trading times. I'm usually co-parenting because there's frequent divorce and chronically difficult people. And they want something. So you are the most wonderful thing. And when you say no. You have always been difficult. You are useless. And I don't know why we bothered having children. It's that flip that happens instantly. So there's a red flag that we can all see right away because that's a crazy making thing. And it causes you to question your sanity and second guess yourself. Like, wow, I thought I was great just a minute ago. Now I'm dirt. How did that happen? Right? So yeah. the, that's one of the red flags that you have to notice is this all or nothing thinking. It's all one way and then all the other. There's no in between time. There's no saying, well, that happened once or twice. These are the people who say always and never. And <laughs> they're, they're mm -hmm. always nailing you with it as though it is your constant state. You're in no wiggle room at all. Interesting. And... Do they really believe what they're saying? They do, you know, do. and that's the thing. That's why the meta, meta, um, metaphor for my work is inclusive compassion. Because mm. these people, we have to have compassion for them and carefully do not condone or enable their behavior. Have compassion, but don't condone or enable the behavior. So the compassion piece comes because things have happened to them in their earlier lives that has produced this. Their perception of what happened to them, their feelings, the result of what happened to them, and they shift into this mode. It can be very traumas that, that maybe everyone can recognize, could be traumas that only that person felt, but that's what's so. And so they, they um, they need our compassion because they are, except for about 1% of them, they are not doing it consciously. Right. Like 
and and we we can't nail them with you did that on purpose because they really didn't and they can't see it and they won't see it because they don't take responsibility for anything that they do everything is always your fault or the weather or the irs or their parents or whatever but never their fault <laughs> so when they're not taking responsibility for anything that's happening, what I find they're doing is they're complaining about the other person, maybe about, you know, like you said, you always, you never. Um, a lot of times I, I feel like what they're saying is almost like they're talking about themselves instead, but they can't see it. They can't see it. No. And they won't see it. They, the, People who have these behaviors and have them all the time are very fragile and they don't appear fragile at all. Right. They're so fragile that they cannot allow themselves to make a mistake or ever be wrong, which is why we have all of the blaming behaviors and the lack of responsibility. They, they are caught in a place that if they ever thought they were wrong, I'm talking about the more extreme people, um, it would shatter them completely shatter them their entire sense of who they are and their identity would just be a pain and too much pain to even consider so they're constantly making sure that their defenses are in place sounds very exhausting it's exhausting and we have to recognize the fear that they come from we mm -hmm. have to have compassion for that incredible level of fear that they come from now, again, I'll say don't condone or enable the behavior, but do have compassion for it. They are not doing it on purpose unless they happen to be like way deeply extreme and in the serial killer <laughs> pattern. <laughs> now, that's a real chronically difficult person. Very. Well, that's psychotic or something. <laughs> Um, so we're not talking about necessarily psychotic people, but we're, th we're talking about people who are in that fear state. And I, what I wanted to capture about what you said about um, if they're always saying things that you feel like they, that represent themselves, but they're not saying it represents themselves or trying to make it seem like it's your fault. I think that would be a red, red flag. It's, it's, it's you who have the issue about sure. this and you're like, Wow, I think they have that issue. <laughs> well, that's that you're it's exactly a red flag. right. And what? you know what we call that in psychology? We call it projection. Mm -hmm. If I'm afraid that I have some part of me that I don't like, I and I won't own it, then I project it out and tell everybody else they have it. And that's exactly what happens, what you're describing. So yes, a big red flag is if, if they take no responsibility for their behavior and blame you for their behavior as well, and are always blaming someone else, another big red flag. So it sounds like you're also alluding to another big red flag is they have no ability to self-reflect? No, none, and no ability to empathize. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so you know, it sounds like a really blanket statement, but they have they know how to appear to empathize but they don't empathize by having that feeling completely in their body and understand because they don't have those feelings or they're significantly reduced mm -hmm. those are good good three red flags that um to help people identify chronically difficult people. Now, once you've identified this, you said talk about having inclusive compassion where you can have compassion for who they are and their situation, but without condoning that behavior or enabling that behavior. That sounds mm -hmm. monumental to do. <laughs> How do you do that? Well, it calls forth a great deal from us because if we if we come into relationship with these people it's often because there are parts of us that are people pleasing and that we make excuses we're over nurturing we deny our own feelings and things so we get in relationship with them and then we're caught and most people then start to make themselves into a pretzel to try to meet the needs of the chronically difficult person and these chronically difficult people, or as I call them in my upcoming book, hijackles, um, they, they want you to continuously be trying to please them. So they're demanding. 
and they want you to uh, give in all the time to so they prey on people they they they're scavengers for power and status and control and wherever they can get it it feeds that deep need that they have because of their fragility so it's very important for us to recognize that if someone never takes responsibility and they're always blaming and we start making ourselves into a pretzel or making excuses for them or denying parts of ourselves or tipping toeing on eggshells all the time, big red flag again that, oh, hey, I'm doing all the bending and stretching here and this other person is doing none. I better have a look at that. Oh, and what if they say they're doing all the bending and stretching? They will say that. And they will say that. That's why, Laura, that I make this my specialty is working with the partners and co-workers of chronically difficult people because of the dynamic that happens that you get kind of caught in that hijackal trap and you don't know you are. You keep thinking you could do something. You could do something better. You could be a better person. You could be more patient. You could try not to say what's on your mind. You could be less assertive. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you will diminish yourself in order to make this person happier. And let me tell you, it is not possible. It is not possible to make them happy. When you do exactly what they want you to do, they're happy for a moment or a day. And then they're back to their very same ways because they need more all the time. It's like, you know, in the little shop of horrors, that plant, you know, Audrey, feed me, feed me. <laughs> and that's the way they are psychologically. They just need to be fed all the time. And winning is their food. So if you happen to do anything that they can they can make you wrong for they will and there's a there's a, a phenomenon called gaslighting i don't know if you remember that very old movie from the 40s called gaslight but it's a phenomenon that happens with chronically difficult people is you tell them what you see or feel or whatever and they tell you you don't and then they change the scenario, they change the feelings, they change whatever. And you say there's a change and then they say, you're crazy, nothing changed. I'm just the same as I always was. Or the situation is the same as it always was. So we call that gaslighting and that's what really makes you nuts. Mm. Like it really causes you to question your sanity because I'm sure something changed. I'm sure that happened. I'm sure we said that. I'm sure you said that. Oh, no, that never happened. <laughs> Even if you have it on tape, I have worked with people who secretly recorded the situations and presented them to the person, a chronically difficult person, and they denied ever saying it. It is complete <laughs> denial. So if we can't condone it, and enable it or we don't want to condone it or enable it and they need to win but we don't want to enable that how do you have a relationship with somebody like that what you have you to have clear expressed maintained boundaries and because they go looking for people who don't have those so that they can have control if you find yourself in a relationship with one of these people you have to find those boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why when people come to me and they say, what do I do? I say, well, first of all, you have to do your own work. Mm -hmm. You've got to know who you are and what's okay with you, what you value, where the edge between what you value and what you don't value is, where what's okay with you and what's not okay with you is. You've got to figure all that out. So the gift of being with a chronically difficult person is to send you to someone like me who can help you see what's going on, define what you want, get better skills and insights, and then strategies. When you're dealing with a chronically difficult person, you want to be authentic as possible, but you also have to be strategic. And that's something that really weighs on people who are not normally like that. To have to be strategic is like, oh, really? Do I have to... I have to manage things in a different way? Why, not, why can't I just say what I want to say? Well, it doesn't work. You already know that if you're with a chronically difficult person. So you do need strategies. Is there a strategy one should start with? 
Well, the first thing is to know that you deserve to take up space and breathe and therefore express how you feel, what you're thinking, what you need and what you want. And when I wrote Kaizen for Couples, I talk in there about that strategy, which is called the Personal Weather Report. And if at any time you just say what's going on for you, you don't ever say the word you, you don't talk about the other person at all. Just learn to tune in to where you are at. What are you thinking, feeling, needing, and wanting? And get clear with that and be able to express it. You know, I feel disrespected right now. I really want to feel good, and right now I don't. And I'm thinking that uh, perhaps this is not working for me to be in a place where I feel disrespected. And um, I, I really want to know that that's not the case. Okay, now I haven't said, hey, you're putting me down all the time and blah, 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 blah. I've just spoken about what's going on for me. And when we get very comfortable with knowing what's going on for us, then we can begin to communicate to the other person. But many of us are not in touch with ourselves. We live in a world that is sort of be more, do more, have more, repeat. And we're just running as fast as we can. And we lose sight of where we are on any given day at any given time sometimes. And so the first step is to slow down and figure out what am I thinking, feeling, needing, and wanting? And know that for yourself. And then know that you deserve to be able to say that, that that you have the right because you breathe and take up space to say assertively, this is what's up for me. That's the first and most important thing. Some internal self-reflection and being able to express oneself clearly, uh, authentically, or actually just knowing it, yeah. So I, I would imagine that the chronically difficult person might not like the boundary setting and the expression of what one wants. Not at all. Not for a moment. Because it immediately begins to put heightened awareness of fear into mm -hmm. them. Like, no, no, I'm going to tell you how it is. And now you're saying, ah, but here's how it is for me. And, you know, now we've got tension. <laughs> And and it will it will it will make it worse in the beginning. Mm. And have you seen it evolve to not be worse and to be better? Well, yes and no. I mean, there's a whole spectrum. Uh, sometimes people are only chronically difficult when they're really backed into a corner, or life is really dumping on them. Mm -hmm. And that goes all the way up to the people who are always like that. They are every minute of their life they have that fear and concern and. And so the ones who are on the milder scale and the ones who really want the relationship to, to be fair and loving, yes, we can see some change. The ones who can't, can't entertain anything beyond themselves and how they want it to be and how they're going to manipulate the situation, no. And, and people who are on that high end of the scale they only come in to see me if they think that they can be the um, the authority who tells me how terrible their partner is. Hmm. You know, and that's sad. And then if I say to them, well, do you have any part in this? Absolutely not. And if I push it, they'll walk out. They'll get angry. They'll say a bunch of things. They'll walk out. Hmm. And the first lesson that happens then for the partner is, to not go after them. And that's very hard when they've been in this tension for a long time. Oh no, you know, he or she's really upset and I don't want that and I'll go and fix it. No. No, no, you have to you have to let them go. They invariably come back because they're not winning at the moment. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's a difficult thing. You know, I'd like to say to you, Laura, that there's there's um Lots and lots and lots of people who turn this around. Um, but they, there are many people who turn it around. But it depends on the, the depth of, of the dysfunction. Right? Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to highlight that you said about chronically difficult people, what I heard for the first time is there's varying degrees in terms of how frequently this pattern um, mm -hmm. arises. But the fact is there is a pattern and they have to win and um, they 
and if they don't win, they're in a lot of fear when they're not mm -hmm. winning. Yeah. And that's what triggers it. And having that compassion is great. And at the same time, setting boundaries that you're not condoning it and enabling it. So you're keeping your sanity um, throughout the, the relationship. Yeah, that's why I call my webinar series Saving Your Sanity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it helps people identify what really is going on. And that's the first step to give yourself mm. a little bit of space to come and find out how do I identify a, a chronically difficult person in my life? Right. Somebody whom I may be interacting with right now. How do I, how do I figure that out? How do I take it off? I could be a better person and I could be kinder and I could be all of those things and sit back and say, maybe we could be different, but I have to acknowledge there's two of us here and each of us are behaving in particular ways. Yes, and taking a deep breath and doing that self-reflection so that you can come strongly to it. It takes a lot of energy. Not only does it take a lot of energy for the chronically difficult person to keep winning, um, but it takes a lot of energy for the partner in that or the coworker in that relationship to keep the boundaries up, to keep the communication, you yeah. know, very strategic, as you say. Mm -hmm. Any advice you have for on the job people dealing with uh, difficult clients, difficult coworkers in that situation? Yeah, first, first and foremost in the job and certainly in, in personal relationships, but on the job, uh, really be aware of not taking it personally. Mm. And that's the big deal. When you don't take it personally, oh, props to that. the other person <laughs> is concerned. Like I didn't, I didn't get where I wanted to go. I didn't score a point. I didn't make a jab. I didn't hurt them in some way. I didn't manipulate them in some way. I couldn't do that. Um, so when you step back and the way that I describe it to people is when you actually see this pattern and yeah, you have to do some work to see the pattern, but when you start to really see the pattern on a daily basis, then you begin to understand that the battle is within them, not with you. Mm -hmm. It's with everybody, everybody who doesn't play the way they want to be played with. And so depersonalize, that's the most important thing. This person, they may say awful things or be horrible, but know that if it were another body sitting in that chair at this moment, the faces are interchangeable. It's not about you. It's it, the battle is within them, not with you. Yeah, so, so number one, and I know that's really hard because in the workplace, you can have it be a little easier, but at home, you start to think, no, well, you know, we should be each other's number one, and we're committed, and and all of that. But these, um, that's not the case. That's not what's going on. The case is an up-down situation, and when you start to speak up, and as you said, you know, it is difficult when you start setting boundaries because. When you do that, they get very afraid. And the more afraid that they get, the more of this behavior that you see. And so it's, um, it's something to be very, very aware of because many of us, you know, think about the holidays right now. You're going home or you're going to somewhere, party, whatever, and part of you is really looking forward to it. And then for many people, there's that person they're dreading to see or that person who's going to throw and upset the entire apple cart at some right. point. And you're walking on eggshells, shoulders up to your earlobes, sitting at, at a celebration dinner, just waiting for that person to ruin it, right? And, and there's a lot of that that goes on. We all know chronically difficult people. Yep. And I know you have such a wealth of information available about how to deal with chronically difficult people. People show up as passive aggressive. You have your new book out, The Hijackal Trap. And I just want to let everybody know that, you know, we're going to be here for just a few more minutes, but you can receive all of Roberta, Dr. Roberta Shaler's uh, information at forrelationshiphelp.com. And tomorrow on socialbuzzu.com. We are actually featuring you, Roberta, uh, with your five empowering strategies for d reducing drama, friction, and tension. So if you want to get some more uh, incredible information, socialbuzzu.com for Roberta's um, webinar. So in-depth strategies. 
Yes, I'm really excited about that, Laura, because we have clients and coworkers and and collaborators and co-creators that we can be very excited to work with and maybe very stimulating intellectually or just plain old difficult, but they may fall into this category. And we don't want to lose the richness that we can mm -hmm. have in these relationships, but we also need to know these five empowering strategies for reducing tension and drama and friction and improving our level of communication and collaboration. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow and I'm excited about that. And, and you know, what we're talking about right now is that it is um, in our, our day to day relationships, just cast your mind around. Is there anybody that you think is in this pattern? Because as we're talking about strategies, think about that one person and what you might be taking from this conversation to do differently, especially over the holiday season. Mm -hmm. So number one thing we said is depersonalize. Do not take it personally. <laughs> yeah, and also, <laughs> hey, I think you saw that smile, Chris, huh? That's funny. Anyway, um, the but and I want to point to that. We we did a blab uh, two weeks ago or so, maybe it was three now. You all can watch about thriving through the holidays and taking care of yourself. And we had a bunch of suggestions, not only for your personal but also through the business. Don't forget to take care of your business during this time too and prepare emotionally and marketing wise uh, for success. So you can really enjoy your holidays, even if you have to deal with difficult people, okay? Like yeah. Chris says, the one you wanna kill, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I'm, I'm out of the corner of my eye, I'm looking at what Chris is saying, but I can't type and talk at the same time. So <laughs> yes, it's amusing. Sometimes they are the people you want to kill, but unfortunately they're often the people that want to kill you. Uh, whether I, that's uh, metaphorically that's or <laughs> <laughs> or emotionally or mentally or physically. So um, in the very extreme, they're the ones who would who, who would be uh, on the physical level. I mean, we're seeing a lot of that right now. I don't want to discuss this in any depth, but look at the political arena, look at the terrorist arena, look at all these things. And you begin to see that we're seeing chronically difficult people who have to be right. They have to win. Everybody else is wrong. And they're making pronouncements, whether that's with their mouth or with their guns. And mm -hmm. it's happening. And so, yes, we can have it on a low level where it's just annoying, but we can also have it on this very, very grand scale. Where we're making sweeping statements about groups of people and you know, restricting and limiting and not tolerating. And, you know, this is all hijackal behavior and it's yes. happening all around us. Indeed it is. It's, um, and so that's why we do these blabs is to help people who want to, it, create a better world of more harmony and peace and we can't just be reacting to these people we have to have compassion and we have to be able to have strategies that you know maybe some of these chronically difficult people will will evolve a little bit more or they I want to say they can't get away with that behavior they're not going to find that it's winning anymore it's working anymore does that make sense mm -hmm. well that that's right I mean you even see people who you know they're they don't want to talk about these subjects. They don't want to listen to this subject. So they start fixating on something else. Like I will have a, like I said earlier, a couple will come in. Uh, one of them is, is exhibiting this behavior. They come because they're an authority on their spouse. If I speak to them about their behavior, what do they do? They start talking about me and say, well, you shouldn't be asking that kind of question. And, you know, what kind of training do you have to be doing this? I mean, they just go off. And you can always watch that if somebody starts to dis to stray from the topic at large in order to win, they may be avoiding this topic completely. They don't want to recognize any of these things in themselves. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's another way that we can tell what's going on if we're astute. And most of us are not aware of these things, which is why I talk about them so much. Yeah. And they're not aware of the strategies as well. And um, we're all about helping people here. So let's get to Amin's question about finding your PhD. Where did you get your PhD? I got my PhD at Columbia Pacific University a long time ago um, in 1989. I'm Canadian. And uh, so I did part of my work in Canada, part of my work in the United States. Great. Thank you. 
Awesome. Um, and your wisdom is what, you know, I've had so many connections with all kinds of people in the counseling world, and I'm by no means I'm an expert in all counselors out there, but um, your philosophies are rich and deep and fresh. And I, I'm so happy and honored to, to talk to you about them here publicly because we need this kind of empowering information out there in the world that I'm not really seeing. And what are, you, what are you seeing out there compared to your work? Well, you know, you're exactly right. I mean, this is why I do what I do. And I, you know, I've written a book last year on Kaizen for Couples, Smart Steps to Save, Sustain and Strengthen Your Relationship. But that that's important work. I love working with couples. But what I've found in working with couples is there's an arena here that is really underserved and underrecognized. And that's why I do what I do is because if you happen to be culled from the herd, which is what will happen if you're with a chronically difficult person in your personal home relationship, um, you start to to believe all of the things that are happening and you start to diminish yourself. And this is not good. And that's what's happening in the world. When you give your power away to somebody who tells you what's right, and they want to argue that their truth is a little more true, and they are always up with that constantly, um, that's defeating and is certainly mm -hmm. not a loving interaction. And so you see people who are pontificating and saying, well, this is the way everybody has to be, and, and they're endeavoring to get followers and to indoctrinate or change their minds or get people to agree with them all the time. Well, you can see what's happening in our world when it happens on a grand scale. You know, can you be recruited on Facebook to want to kill people? Mm -hmm. Apparently you can. But who are those people? These are people who we're talking about today. These are people who want power. They want control. They want status. They want somebody to say, yeah, you go. Go ahead. Take that AK-47. Go to that theater. Go do that kind of thing. And wow, you will, you will be wonderful. You will belong. And wow, that's coming from a terrible deficit if that's the kind of thing that you allow yourself to be taken in by. You know, you don't have any boundaries. You don't have a sense of who you are. You don't know what you value. You're adopting, inheriting, and adapting somebody else's set of values. And that's never a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yep. So kudos to your work. Thank you so much for sharing the nuances of difficult. Well, really, we talk mostly about chronically difficult people. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, difficult people may be people having a bad day who are just venting, getting it out um, or suppressing that over and over again. And then it comes out. So that's a whole nother um, part of this topic, right? Right. that we want to talk about is like, okay, so we've identified the chronically difficult, the people who need to win and have a lot of fear and we have to set boundaries with. But what about the difficult people? What What's that all about and how is that impacting us? Well, that's again, we need to have boundaries because just making it through life with absolutely wonderful people, we need to have boundaries. Otherwise, we don't know who we are. Exactly. But when people are occasionally difficult, do have some compassion for them. If mm -hmm. they're not normally like that, give them some wiggle room. <laughs> yep. Ask if you can help. Um, tell them you're present and willing to talk and you know that this is an aberration and unusual and you're wondering what's underneath it. That Those are the kind of conversations that compassionate people have with one another. People who are empathetic and can put themselves in another person's shoes for a bit. So that's yeah. what you do there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, great. So we have so much to offer. Be sure to connect with Roberta if you want to uh, hear more in depth. Thanks, Subdul. Um, we've got uh, socialbuzzu.com tomorrow webinar with Dr. Roberta Shaler and more from her at her website for relationshiphelp.com. So. And remember, too, that you have all kinds of wonderful things at transformtoday.com. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're having these great conversations because we both have a great depth of interest and knowledge to share and want to create great conversations and questions. So do go to transformtoday.com as well. Thank you. And we will be back again for more Blabs. Um, we will keep you posted on that through Twitter and Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye. <laughs>